Hi, this is Pat Love from Love Healing Hearts, here to read scripture, Galatians chapter 4. And we will be followed by Pat's two cents. Now, we're going to start at verse 23. And then we're going to explain what we're dealing with. This is bond versus free. Which do you want to be, bound or free? You want to be locked down or do you want to have total liberty? Well, check it out. Remember, there's a, another scripture that says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Sometimes we as church people forget that. Let's not forget our freedom. Amen? Listen. All right. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. All right. Let me start at verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. Now, I'm going to explain that real quick so you can hear what, what happened. In the story of Abraham, God called him. He promised him all the land that he could see, every as far as his eye could see, as far as his imagination could go, was all his. And he also promised him a son, his own son. But as human beings will do, we put our little finger in the mix and decide to help God out a little bit, don't we? And we end up making a good thing a mess. So what did Abraham's wife do? She got frustrated, Sarah. She got frustrated because the baby hadn't come. They had already gotten a promise where they were way too old to even conceive, make love, or anything. Well, now God makes them this promise they're going to have a son. Years, decades go by. And she's like, hey, we need to make this thing happen. You know, like God must be on a coffee break or something. So she sends her husband. And you know, men, you know, they're, they're ready, willing, and able, whatever. She sends her husband in to her handmaiden. Well, she gets pregnant by his child. Her name is Agar, all right? She has a son, calls him Ishmael. But that is not the son of the promise. That's the son of bondage because she was her bond servant. Now, God promised them a son of their own. Well, years later, they do have a son. God tells them to call him Isaac. When they call him Isaac and he grows up to a certain age, there starts to become a problem with Ishmael and Isaac. There also is a problem between Hagar and Sarah. So Sarah tells Abraham, you send them away because it's not good that they should come up together. And when Abraham, brokenhearted, goes to God, says, well, Lord, what's up with that? And God says, Sarah has told you truly, the bond should not be raised with the free. They cannot cohabit. It is diametrically opposed to God's way. So if you are trying to be free and you're bound, there are issues that you need to take up with God and go for him for deliverance because the two should not cohabit. Here we go. Now listen to the especially religious bondage. Oh, that's the dangerous, subtle one right there. And many of us don't realize we're still under bondage because we have chosen to be. All right. Now, we're going to read on verse 23. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Remember God said Abraham believed God? Simply believe, faith, just faith, believed him. And it was counted unto him for righteousness, the way we're supposed to believe in Jesus Christ. All right, verse 24. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, old and new. I'm adding old and new so you'll understand 
This is not what the word says. I'm saying this. The Old Testament was the old promise. The New Testament is the new covenant. Those are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. That's what that exemplified. I'm adding that's what that exemplified. That's not the word. That's me talking. Verse 25. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all, the mother of us all, free. All right, now listen. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bears not, break forth and cry thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an, has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Listen to this. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Now I'm going to go back to Jesus. The days of Jesus Christ, Pat's two cents. The days of Jesus Christ, he was the free promise. He was freedom. He represented liberty. The scribes and Pharisees were the church folk, church leadership. They represented bondage, flesh, the law. Do you get what I'm saying? So what ends up happening is they can't get with Jesus' program because Jesus' program totally obliterates their control, and they don't like that. So everything that pertains to him is based in love and, and faith. Everything that pertains to the, the, the leaders of the churches, of the temples, the uh, synagogues, dealt with law, legalism, bondage, flesh. Doing it yourself, not depending on the help and power of the Holy Spirit. We do this thing till it kills us. And we keep laws and rules and regulations and traditions. And that's not what God wanted from the second promise, the second covenant. Okay, now... Nevertheless, this is verse 30. What saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Now, before I go any further, let's make another example. Pat's two cents again. In the New Testament, it says, in essence, I'm not doing a direct quote, when you deal with the old wine, old wine is the old way. And when you pour old wine into new wineskins, the wineskins burst. So you have to pour new wine into the new wineskins. There is a problem trying to mix old and bondage with new and liberty. There's a serious problem. And we as a church have to be very careful not to bound each other up with traditions, with rudiments, with laws. The law is passe. The principles of the law are very much here. But legalism of the law is not. That's why Jesus came. He came to fulfill the law. But he didn't come to enforce the law. It's a difference. All right. Now, verse 31. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. God, please anoint this in Jesus' name. Help me to explain this. Okay. So what happens is a lot of times we go to church, depending upon what church we go to, there are certain doctrinal beliefs. Okay, you should go to God to find out what you should really believe. 
because when you get through integrating, mixing bond with free, meaning you're integrating people's interpretations, opinions, attitudes, whatever, and you mix that with the truth, you end up with a mixed multitude of confusion because there are some things that we believe that we want to stick to. I mean, we want to stick to our beliefs. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, like grabbing the horns of the altar and never letting go. And God is saying, let it go. Let it go. You got me. You don't need that. You got me. Okay. You've got Jesus Christ. That is the fulfillment of it all. And your understanding will be plain and clear if you consult with God through the Holy Spirit. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. Revelation, baby. So we cannot enforce our attitudes, our opinions on other people. It's not fair. Some of the doctrines that we have engrafted into our our foundational belief system should be thrown right in the trash because Jesus came to free us up from all of that, from observing months and years and new moons and holy days and Sabbaths. It says that in the word. We are to be freed up from that. But no, we as people that are driven by flesh, in spite of the Holy Spirit, in spite of Jesus, we choose to be in bondage. So when something new comes along, something fresh, we resist because that's not the way we do it. We've never done it like that. Something's wrong with that. That seems a little too worldly or that seems a little too, that's a little too loose. Things could go wrong. Do you trust God or not? Trust God. It's his program, not yours. So why don't you just trust him? Trust him to correct if you go too far to the right or to the left. Trust him. He knows how to take care of what belongs to him. So we have no need to fear. If we want to dance in the spirit, why not? Who's stopping you? If we want to lay prostrate on the floor and worship, Go for it, baby. If we want to sing in tongues during worship, worship now. We're talking corporate worship. Everybody's making a joyful noise. Go for it. Don't let every little nook and cranny, every little dot and tittle bring you under bondage. That's not what it's for. It's just to stop things from getting out of hand because the Holy Spirit knows how to do that. We don't have to be Holy Ghost policemen. Do you hear what I'm saying? I remember one time there was a man. Every single weekend, he went to prison ministry. And one of the ladies from the church was bothered by that. Because when she asked him, what church do you belong to? He didn't have a name. He said the prison was his church. He went every weekend. And guess what? I don't believe that's a problem with God. But it can be a problem with us church folk and our going to church tradition. The church is within you. Wherever you go, you take the church. That's the church. It's people gathering in the name of Jesus. Where there are one or two or three gathered together, I'm just, I'm just ad-libbing. I'm not directly quoting. Guess what? Where there are two or three gathered in, in his midst. He's right there in our midst. Two or three gathered in his name. I'm trying to correct myself. He is in our midst. So when you gather... It doesn't matter if you have an A and B selection, a C or D selection, worship, praise, testimony, prayer, falling on your knees and prostrate, jumping up and down, dancing for joy, whatever your expression is, be free. If you don't belong to a church with a name and a doctrinal belief, 
but you are totally engrafted in in uh, homeless outreach every single weekend. You're faithful to that ministry and you are there and a bunch of you are doing your thing and you feed off of each other and you bless and minister to one another and you get edified as well as they. And the spirit of God is meeting you there. You don't have to apologize for not belonging to a church. You are the church. It's not the walls. It's not the name. It's not the denomination. It's you. It's you and the ones you're meeting with in the name of Jesus, under the power and unction of the Holy Spirit. Don't let anybody bind you down. If they don't believe in what you're doing, tough. If you get confirmed, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? If you get vindicated, if you get uh, encouraged, by God himself, you owe no man an apology. You keep doing what you're doing. Listen to what I'm saying. Don't allow people to box you in or box you out. They can't put you in hell and they can't put you in heaven. You do what you believe God is leading you to do. Do it with all your might. Pour your heart into it. Do it in love, 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 not ego, love. If you see your ego getting in the mix, rebuke it, ask God to kick it out. And if you got to sit down for a while till you get that together, do so. But serve God when you do, serve him with all your heart and totally ignore. And I don't mean to be rebellious. But ignore the naysayers that aren't doing anything themselves anyway. You will always have people with opinions. Where there are people, there are opinions. That's why denominations have come into play. But trust me, denominationalism is divisive. That is not of God. But because we have so many people with so many different opinions, and we're in the dispensation of grace, and God is merciful, loving, understanding, and kind, long-suffering, on and on. Guess what? He allows a lot of our errors. He allows it. He's like, okay, whatever. If he allows it, if he allows us to be free to be wrong, trying to do it right, then who are any of you to criticize another brother or sister who is serving God with all their might? You, some of you may not believe in female preachers, and that's fine. But if you see one out there doing their thing and 10 people get saved under that ministry, then you need to shut your mouth because that might be 10 people that may never have been reached by a man's approach. Some people are affected by a female touch and some people are affected by a male touch. And God knows that. God is not under the bondage you are. So because somebody had something to say in a particular scripture in the New Testament, it's not a blanket statement or else God would never have put Deborah as a judge over Israel. What was she doing there? How did she become judge? She wasn't voted in. She was God appointed. When all men probably thought, oh, no way God wouldn't use a woman. If God uses a woman, you be quiet. God knows who can reach who. So keep your opinions to yourselves. For those of you who want to live in bondage, and for those of you who want freedom, live in your freedom. Go for it with all your might. Don't back up. Don't, don't get afraid. Don't get intimidated by man's opinions. Because God said, put your confidence in God, not in man. That's the one whose approval you seek. You're not sure what God thinks about it. You're not sure how he feels about you doing this, that, or the other in his name. What you do, 
get that Bible out. You sit down and you ask God to lead you to scripture, lead you to three or four scriptures that confirm each other. And you will know when you see the central theme, you might end up being misled by a few. Maybe your imagination gets in it. But if you get six, seven or eight scriptures and five or six of them have the exact same vein, have the exact same message, you go with that and know that you're hearing from God. Sometimes we don't know how to hear from God. So I'm making that as a suggestion. Okay. Some of us can pray and God will literally speak to us. Okay audibly. And there are other times we'll say something or we'll pray something and the Holy Spirit will seal it in our hearts and witness in our spirit. And we know that we know that we know we've heard from God. Then there may be other times when God says, not yet. Or a friend of mine said, I told you to teach, not preach. God knows how to take care of what belongs to him. And if people are winning people to the Lord, if people are enabling others to get inner healing, to get deliverance, freedom, who are you to criticize? God will not, he will not contradict himself, which means he will not anoint. He will not prosper your way if you're not in his will. You might get prospered by the devil, but it ain't gonna be but a minute. And you find out it's really a trap or it's got a stinger at the end. But when God anoints the things that happen in people's lives last, it's in good ground. They're really being moved by God. The, 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 uh, the work, the effectual fervent prayers of the saints availeth much. People really see change. Old things are passed away. Behold, behold. All things are become new. So you have to know that you have to allow people to be free. You may have your opinions. Shut your mouth and pray about it. Just pray about it. God, if you're not in that, don't anoint it. If you are in it, anoint it with all your might, even though I may not agree with it. If you're anointing them, hey, remember the church people didn't agree with the things Jesus did because a lot of it went against what they knew as their law. You don't heal on the law. You don't work on the law on the Sabbath. You don't, you don't work against the law on the Sabbath. The law says you rest, yet you heal a withered hand. Well, guess what? God's principle is it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And that's what Jesus did. Good, good, good every day. And he is the Sabbath. He is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. So we don't have to get hung up on a day. We don't have to get hung up on new moons, Sabbaths, or months, or holy days. Jesus is the fulfillment of it all. We have him. We have it all. When we enter into his rest, it doesn't just mean that we don't do the laundry and we don't do the dishes. No, we enter into the rest of Jesus Christ, which is the peace that passes all understanding. He gives peace, not as the world gives. He gives true peace. And with his peace comes a rest, which means when we need to forgive, when we need to do something good, and it's diametrically opposed to the way we feel or to what we want to do or against our flesh, When we ask God for help, boom, the help is there and the ability to do it, the power to do it is miraculously available. And we find it so much easier to do because we have entered in to his rest. We ceased from our works and our efforts and we have entered in to his power and he makes what he requires of us far easier than human beings trying to follow the law. Okay, I'm done. I hope you get that about freedom versus bondage. God bless you.